I'm Jenny Levine, Humanities and Adult Programming Coordinator for Durham County Library. This program is sponsored by the Durham Library Foundation and the Durham Arts Council. Uh, let's see, as always we have great programs coming up. Please sign up for the mailing list. Um, and we don't have the brochure anymore, but see me afterwards if you want to get on my email list or if you're not getting a weekly email about programs. Restrooms are out this door and to your left. And today we have the People's Channel recording this very popular program. And if you want to know when that is available on our website and on YouTube, you can also get an email list from me after the program. And I'll let you guys know when it's ready. And if you enjoyed today's program, I would appreciate you filling out an evaluation form uh, after the show. The show. <laughs> the program. It feels like a show with this number. David Menconi is Raleigh-based writer of creative nonfiction has been selected as the region's 2019 Piedmont Laureate. <laughs> During 2019, Mr. Manconi will appear at workshops, reading programs, and speaking engagements throughout Durham, Orange, and Wake Counties. David will also post on the Piedmont Laureate blog throughout the year. Mr. McConey has been a music critic and arts reporter at the News and Observer in Raleigh since 1991. He's also written for Rolling Stone, Spin, Billboard, New York Times, and Salon.com. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Does he have time? His books include the 2012 biography, Brian Adams, Losering, A Story of Whiskey Town, University of Texas Press, and his next book will be a history of North Carolina music for UNC Press. And if you don't have a seat, there's a couple here um, on the wall. Anybody else have an empty seat? I'll try to get if there's one more right here. I'm so sorry we don't have enough seats for everyone, but um, you're clearly very dedicated. Please help me welcome Mr. David McCoy. Thank you very much, and uh, yeah, I'd like to bring out the rest of our participants. First, Bill Phillips. <laughs> Longtime historian and blues gadfly. Uh, this, these, this wonderful collection of records back here comes from his uh, personal stash. You might want to check it out. And uh, Daryl Stover. Who came prepared with the Bruce Baston uh, Red River Blues book, among other things. Uh, he's a poet and scholar of much renown. And uh, finally, Glenn Henson from UNC. And uh, yeah, the, the book she mentioned should be out uh, September 2020 and uh, covers about 100 years of North Carolina music history. And uh, various chapters have spirit guides to kind of keep me between the lines and from going in the ditches. And Glenn was my spirit guide for the blues chapter, one of them. And uh, just, just we're, we're going to talk for a spell, and then Lightning's going to play some songs to kind of uh, illustrate what we've been talking about. And I'm going to read just a bit from the aforementioned book. Not a lot, uh, just because that gets kind of droney. Uh, just as preamble and setup. And uh, the Durham Blues chapter is chapter two in the narrative, right after Charlie Poole, the pre bluegrass guy, and ahead of Arthur Smith, from, uh, Mr. Guitar Boogie over in Charlotte. The established narrative of 20th century American music has that all blues came from the Mississippi Delta after Robert Johnson met the devil down at the crossroads late one night. It's a powerful myth, even though the reality is a bit more complicated. A mixture of field hollers, folk tunes, and spirituals synthesized by African-American slaves and their descendants, blues started out as music sung by people trying to make the crushing hardship of their workday a little less oppressive. The music also followed the fortunes of blacks in the United States. By the time of the post-Civil War Industrial Revolution taking hold in the early 1900s, the blues were migrating north as part of the greater diaspora of African Americans leaving the South, seeking factory jobs. In Chicago, the music went electric and rock and roll was not far behind. All of which is true as far as it goes, which isn't far enough. 
For one thing, it overlooks North Carolina as an important blues hub, especially Durham, which became a hotbed of acoustic Piedmont blues for many of the same practical reasons that drew former sharecroppers to northern cities in search of greater economic opportunity. Plenty of African Americans found similar opportunities in Durham, which was still just a village of fewer than 100 people at the close of the Civil War. But its population had grown to more than 50,000 by the time Charlie Poole died in 1931. While Poole's old stomping grounds up near the Virginia line was textile country, Durham was one of the nation's foremost tobacco towns, which would play a huge role in the city's blues prominence. The big players in town included industrialist James B. Buck Dukes, American Tobacco Company, known for Duke of Durham cigarettes, and W.T. Blackwell and Company, whose brand of Bull Durham tobacco became enough of a marker that Durham was dubbed the Bull City. Durham's tobacco factories employed enough African Americans to create a sizable black working class with a stable economy in which workers could make $12 to $15 per week, multiples more than they could sharecropping. Tobacco helped Durham weather the economic upheavals of the 1930s far better than much of America because demand for cigarettes, it seemed, wasn't just recession-proof, but depression-proof. By the end of the 1930s, more than 12,000 people lived and worked in Durham's predominantly black Haiti district, many of them running their own small businesses. Larger African-American institutions dotted the local horizon, too, including North Carolina Mutual Insurance Company, one of black America's early great companies, started by a former slave in 1898. Mechanic and Farmers Bank, Carolina Times newspaper, and North Carolina College for Negroes, later North Carolina Central University. And yet none of this should be taken to mean that Durham was an, an enlightened racial paradise. Durham celebrated its African-American mercantile class with slogans like Chicago of the South and City of Opportunity. But segregation still divided the Bull City along lines of race and class, as rigidly as it did Memphis or Birmingham. Glenn Henson interviewed black elders in the 1990s who remembered marchers from the Ku Klux Klan being regular participant in Duke University's annual homecoming parade down Durham Main Street 60 years earlier. And when the struggle for civil rights came to Durham in the 1950s and 60s, Desegregation proved to be as wrenching and ultimately irreconcilable there as the rest of the South. But for all that, in the 20s and 30s, Durham still had an African-American working class getting by well enough to have money for entertainment, which local musicians would provide in and around the warehouses, cafes, barbershops, porches, house parties, fish fries, and pig pickings. The scene was particularly bustling during harvest time, when farmers would bring their tobacco leaves into town and sell them at auction. Newly flushed with cash to spend, they'd hit Durham's shopping district in a celebratory mood. So busking blues musicians would set up shop in and around the warehouses, put out a hat, start to play, and hope to draw a crowd. It worked well enough for Durham's reputation to grow among the songster set. If you called yourself playing the blues, declared Sam Pegleg Jackson, then you had to come to Durham, because that's where the music really was. So that sort of sets the scene. During the 1930s, there was this scene in, around Durham, and uh, we're going to kind of get into the, the where's of that. So I, I kind of covered the economic reasons for there being a blues scene here. Was what, what, what other factors were, were going on? Any of the Daryl, do you want to maybe take that one? I think David and audience, when we start to look at why Durham for this bustling blues uh, outlet, you do have to understand, you heard David reference this working class that existed. And that working class didn't sit in isolation and didn't just sit around the tobacco houses. People had places where they lived. People had churches, people had schools. And so for me, uh, as a historian, uh, the agency resided with how the music was handed down and passed on and experienced. You know, folks didn't buy tickets to go see the blues. Blues was on their porch. Blues was in their backyard. Blues was at the fish fries. The blues was, you know, who they were. They were family members and friends. And so I think about it in the context of community. And I think there was community here. And so when we talk about the significance of Durham 
there were thriving black communities, and in those communities were artists. And that's where these artists resided, you know, because they didn't play all year long on that corner. They played in other places. One of the interesting things that I looked at before I came here was uh, the interview that uh, was done by Glenn with Richard Trice, uh, who was known as uh, Little Boy Fuller. And, and he talked about, and actually took the filmmakers around showing him where there clearly had been a juke joint at one time, dance floor and everything, which no longer exists now. I remember having a young kid when I used to book the Bull Little Blues Festival uh, asking me, well, Mr. Stover, where's the juke joints at? I want to go, that's where I want to go here to music. I said, well, there's liquor houses now, no juke joints. And you, you can go to Mississippi, but you're not going to find that sort of an experience here in Durham now. So I think the main key point to answer your question, David, is community, uh, thriving black communities, ways and means by which this music could be handed down. And maybe a little bit later, I'll share a point that speaks to that. Is Kenny Dalsheimer here? No. Okay. Um, I, I would like to encourage everybody to uh, look up a film of his called Shine On. You, uh, it, yeah, it's actually on YouTube also. Uh, just if you Google Richard Trice and Shine On, it should come up. And uh, that's a real, that, that was done, what, about 15, 20 years ago? It was done in 2002. Yeah. And uh, they took him around looking for places like that. And uh, I think that's a scene in that movie. Mm -hmm. Glenn and Bill, y'all knew a lot of these old timers in, late in life, did you not? You, Glenn, how, how long have you been here? <laughs> this is the 30s? <laughs> I came to Durham in 71 and, and actually began the intensive attempt to try to unfold some of this history back in 74. And at that point, 74 and 75, a lot of these elder musicians, not those that went on to become popular in terms of recording and later becoming part of the folk revival in the 60s and such, but those who stayed here, those who were eminently part, as Daryl said, of communities, a lot of those folks were definitely still around in, at that point, with, filled with stories about the heyday of Durham when, the heyday of Durham's black musical scene, at least blues musical scene, when this music was indeed everywhere. And it was not at all restricted to the few who recorded, but was in fact men and women, younger and older, playing instruments that ranged from guitar to mandolin to accordion. Sort of a whole side of the scene that, that when we think about the blues now, we don't really catch. Bill. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, happy to be here. Um, I grew up in Durham, and um, until I was 27 or 28, had no idea that this kind of music existed. Um, and, and Durham was a very fragmented community. People in various niches of the community were rather isolated. And, um, particularly in the 1950s and 60s. Um, so it was, I got interested in folk music and it was, it was thrilling to find out that all this music had been in Durham at one point. Um, started out being interested in bluegrass and folk music and then got interested in the blues and learned about um, a fellow named Willie Trice who was, uh, the brother of Richard Trice. Um, and I can't wait to see that video. I'm sorry I didn't see it before I came. Um, <coughs> Willie at that time had uh, started playing his guitar again after about 30 years of not playing it. And uh, a fellow named Pete Lowry came down from the north and found the guitar under Willie's bed and had it restored in Boston and brought it back to him. So he started practicing and then we discovered he had known all the blues players 
in Durham in the 1940s and the 1930s. So, Blind Boy Fuller, uh, Gary Davis, um, Brandon McGee, and Sonny Terry. And at that time, um, I was a social worker in Durham County Social Services. Uh, being interested in the blues, it just occurred to me one day that uh, Gary Davis and Blind Boy Fuller might have case records um, in the old files. And uh, so I went into the file room, which was pretty ancient, though they were in a new building, and I uh, discovered that the case records for the blind were really the most prestigious records there, and, and the best social workers were assigned to those cases. Um, and they dictated every visit that they had um, with their clients. So I started looking through it, and um, Blind Boy Fuller's case was under Fulton Allen, and then Gary Davis was under Gary Davis, and they, the folders were like two inches thick. And um, I looked through them, and at that time, you know, concerns over privacy were not as great as they were today. <laughs> I, I doubt I could have ever taken those cases out. Uh, but I asked the, um, the director of social services if we could, uh, if I could take these out and make copies of them. And uh, he said, if you get permission from the family, then uh, you can. So, uh, Blind Boy Fuller at Fulton Allen's wife, Cora Allen, was still living in Durham. And as I recall, I got some sort of very casual verbal approval from her to copy the record. Um, Gary Davis had died in New York a couple of years earlier. I had no way to get in touch with his wife that I think was still living for a while after that. So basically, I just copied the records <laughs> and uh, took the copies home and read them, and, and they were fascinating. Uh, really, um, quite a cordial relationship between the caseworkers and the clients. Um, though the idea was that uh, if you made money in any manner, then you were not eligible for the, the $25 a month or something like that, payments. So there was constant questioning about whether they were making money. And this questioning was after um, uh, Blind Boy Fuller had been to New York at least twice and recorded. And um, Gary Davis had been once, and they also would play on the street. And if you, if you hear any of their um, songs, it must have been a phenomenal sound on the street. Uh, they were pretty incredible. Uh, Gary Davis often played by himself, and then Blind Boy Fuller would play with Sonny Terry by that time on the street, and um, a washboard player named George Washington that they called Bull City Red. And they had recorded, the three of them had recorded together, but uh, imagine listening on the street corner to, to that sound it was, it was pretty amazing. Uh, and clearly they were filling up the half of the coins. Uh, and, but when the social worker came, you know, wanted to deny that they had got any money, uh, understandably so. Um, so there was this little banter back and forth and the, uh, the social workers, I think, were, were pretty sympathetic and impressed a time or two they heard the music, realized that they were dealing with fairly special people here. So, um, those case records are now all over the internet. Um, and I, I suspect today that would not be possible. I mean, it's, it's out of my hands. <laughs> but, but, there's nothing there that I think any Gary Davis or, or Blind Boy Fuller would not want to, to have out there because they they come through looking looking great. But there there's stories about their illnesses and their um, 
being taken to the doctor, I discovered uh, blind boy Floyd and I had the same eye doctor. <laughs> um, <clears throat> they were about, you know, 20 year gap between them. Um, anyway, I don't know what I'm sure, but that's... <laughs> Do those original records still exist? Do you know? Uh, yes. <laughs> the, the original records, I'm assuming, being the 78s. Um, oh, no, no, I mean. <laughs> oh, oh, no. The disability records. Um, I do not have copies. I basically gave my copies, and I'm, I'm sorry I gave them away at this point, too. Um, and I don't know if Scott Angel still has it, but I believe I gave it to him. Uh, but Bruce Baston in England, I believe, has copies. And there's another uh, blues writer on the internet that I discovered last week that has a significant part of it, if not the old copies. But the originals, the social services still has those files. The, the originals are down there. And I don't know why I could never found a file for Sonny Terry, but he was a, one of the clients as well. I can think of any number of institutions around here that would like to have those at this end date, but I, I hope they're still there. Um, and, and sort of the big four, the, the Mount Rushmore of Durham Blues back then was Blind Boy Fuller, Gary Davis, and Sonny and Brownie. And um, we know about them in large part because of records. They, all the four of them, not Gary Davis so much, but the other three left behind more of a discography than most blues men at that, blues men at that time. And uh, that was in large part because of J.B. Long. And we have a picture of him, do we not? I just quickly go over here. Um, J.B. Long might be the most unusual record mogul ever. He uh, ran the dollar store on Club Boulevard. That's him with his daughter. Actually, the dollar store was on Main Street. On Main Street, okay. Main Street, right at Five Points. The United Dollar Store was in the place that is now the empty lot in front of Main Street Bakery. Oh, wow. So, prominently placed. He lived on Club. Ah, that probably explains the confusion. I've, I've seen Baston Club. Has it wrong. Yeah. Bruce Baston has it wrong. Yes. Wow. <laughs> that is good to know ahead of publication. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to be put any fake news. So, uh, Jamie Long, his story kind of begins in Durham, where, and not in Durham, in Kinston, rather, right, where he ran the dollar store, and uh, he used to play records. And it, he discovered it would keep people in his store longer if he played music. After a time, people started asking to buy the records. So uh, he turned into kind of a proto record store clerk. Uh, people would come in asking for records, and he could uh, figure out what they were wanting based on them humming a few bars. Sort of thing <laughs> thing. And this was back in the uh, 19, early 1930s. And disaster songs were kind of the CNN of the time. People would do these uh, stories, uh, story songs like the wreck of the old '97, and uh, you know that's that's how lore got handed around about disasters. Well, people started coming in asking him about any records pertaining to the Lumberton wreck, and it was a grisly accident apparently between a train and a truckload full of farmers. And he called up his record supplier and said, you know, hey, you got anything about the Lumberton wreck? And they said, no, but why don't you make that? So uh, being an enterprising sort, J.B. Long hired a newspaper writer down there to co-write a song, and they co-wrote a very grisly tune called <laughs> Lumberton Wreck. And then he had a talent contest to figure out who was going to record it. This being the 1930s, there was one white and one black. The African-American group that won was Mitchell's Christian Singers, who went on to a very notable gospel career, the old-style a cappella jubilee gospel quartet. Uh, they were on the Spirituals to Swing concert 
that uh, John Hammond put together at Carnegie Hall in 1938. And uh, the uh, Cauley family won the white contest and they recorded Lumberton Wreck and you can, you can find this, it's on YouTube if you've never heard it. They've got a keening fiddle riff Im imitating the uh, train whistle and it's quite a period piece. But this got J.B. Long into the record business. A few years later, he winds up in Durham running the dollar store on Main Street. Thank you. And uh, he arrives in Durham basically at the heyday of Blind Boy Fuller. And uh, stories vary as to how Blind Boy Fuller crossed his path, but uh, he set up an arrangement with him to take him up to record. And uh, that is his young daughter that he's posed with there. And according to J.B. Long's grandson, he would take his daughter along with these guys to recording sessions in New York. Um, unfortunately, she's elderly and in the throes of Alzheimer's, so I was not able to interview her. But. So anyway, thanks to J.B. Long, Blind Boy Fuller left behind about 130 songs recorded, which have stayed in print all these years. Um, it's really too bad that there weren't other people like him to record some of these other folks. But tell me a little bit, y'all, about some of the some of the folks J.B. Long missed. You know, thanks to him, we know all about Blind Boy Fuller. Not all about, but a lot. But who who would be on your wish list from, of, of people you wish had been better recorded back then? So I'm going to mess with a comment that you made earlier. Okay. Where you cited the stereotype of Robert Johnson because Durham had its own. Scrap Harris was a remarkable guitarist by all accounts. And Scrap Harris was someone who also was said to have sold his soul to the devil. Scrap, in fact, Scrap Harris was so well known in Durham that for decades after his name was sort of used, folks would say, now that's a real Scrap Harris. As if to say, that guy has got really something going on. But Scrap, the stories abound, but Scrap sold his soul out in Creedmoor. Out <laughs> at <laughs> Crossroads in Creedmoor. The stories that are told about Scrap are hair-raising. They're far more detailed than the stories we have, for instance, of Robert Johnson and such. And they were, they were completely well told within African-American communities in Durham. Like I say, I was hearing them still in the 90s. So, so Scrap would be, he'd be number one on my list. Yeah, for me, it's, it's, it's not so much the people that you don't hear because of nothing beats the Scrap Harris tales. Nothing, nothing, <laughs> nothing. I've I heard some of them as well. But you need to keep in mind that, for example, Richard Trice would talk about how his parents were musicians. His mother played the piano. His father played the band. So there were many people within families and churches who were musicians. And so this musicality that existed in black communities goes undocumented in its uh, complete context uh, when we look at, yes, uh, the significance of the uh, Mount Rushmore uh, of, of recorded Durham Blues musicians. But there were so many others playing within their households, playing within their churches, that yes, you know, we have no documentation of, but we know that music was quite a vibrant thing here, as in most places. And it would have been nice, yes, to, to have had access to that in in more uh, direct and, if you will, physical ways, because I'm a man of vinyl. And yes, <laughs> I would love to have vinyl of so many of these other folks within the community, within these households, that we can only speak of within that context when we hear even some of these musicians talking about their family members, their aunts and uncles, fathers and mothers. I don't have a lot to add. But the Scrap Harris story is new to me, so that's, that's fascinating. Um, Bruce Baston, uh, the English fellow who um, was here in the early 70s and studied a lot of this music, uh, said in one of his books that um, it's a complete myth that the best people 
or the best musicians were the ones that were recording. So that there are many excellent musicians that um, did not get recorded. And some of the recordings, uh, Robert Johnson, for instance, his recordings were almost an accident. Uh, just a brief time um, when he went to Texas and made, recorded a few songs. And without doing that, uh, the Rolling Stones would have never done it in vain. So um, I, I'm sure that, as you say, many enduring the next one. People that we don't know about. So I want to add the fact that there are a lot of women musicians that we don't know about at all. That in terms of the blues world, when folks talk about the guitar players playing out in the streets and at the parties and at the tobacco warehouses, they tend to focus on the men. And yet, when you talk to many of these men, they talk about their sisters or their aunts, that as they would always say, they were every bit as good as we were. Um, and they tended not to play, you would hear them at parties, you wouldn't hear them at the warehouses or on the streets as much. But that doesn't mean that they didn't play a huge and shaping role in the music in Durham. And so it's the, it's the hidden history of the Bull City women guitarists and mandolin players and banjo players and fiddlers and accordion players that, uh, that really needs fleshing out. That's the place where I really want to know more. Interesting to note that uh, two of the most prominent North Carolina blues women were discovered, discovered by the mainstream very late. Um, and that would be Libba Cotton, of course, who uh, died 32 years ago today. Maybe we'll hit a freight train later. And also Etta Baker, who uh, retired from the from mill work and uh, went pro in her 60s. So, yeah, it's funny how those two, at an age when a lot of people were looking to retire, were just getting started as far as commercial music careers. And you know, it, uh, just a, a partial list of some of the reference points in rock and pop culture that you can find from Durham blues and blues in this area, of course. Pink Floyd, Pink Anderson and Floyd Council, right down the road at Chapel Hill. Um, and everybody from Grateful Dead to Peter, Paul, and Mary covered by Gary Davis. And Ry Cooter, Bob Dylan, Jefferson Airplanes, Yorma Common are a few of the many guitar players to show Gary Davis' influence. <laughs> English rock bands were especially enamored with uh, Fuller. Led Zeppelin rewrote Fuller's I Want Some of Your Pie into 1975's Custard Pie while the Rolling Stones titled the 1970 live album after his song, Get Your Yaya's Out. And of course, early 1990s, folk rock groups started at Winston-Salem's School of the Arts, named after a Sonny and Brownie song, Jump Little Children. So funny, given this rich history, there are very few physical markers of it still around. It, you know, you can find like the facade of Liberty Warehouse, where a lot of this went on, it's the facade for a luxury apartment building downtown Durham. Uh, Blind Boy Fuller's house on Massey Avenue, not far from here, still stands. And uh, there's a few murals here and there. And uh, I, you know, I wonder if y'all could talk about some of the forces that conspired to uh, you know, make that so. I, I will say a large part of it is disinterest. The aforementioned J.B. Long, I found this stunning. He went on to a career in politics after his recording days were done, and when he died in 1975, his obit in the Burlington paper where he lived after Durham made no mention whatsoever of any of the records he made. You know, this is a guy who, you know, was partly responsible for some of the greatest records in the blues canon and nothing, not a word. I was Why me? I yeah. Well, I think it's important to note within the context of this, this celebration and uh, establishing a ways and means for us to continuously be able to access and be knowledgeable and, if you will, pay homage to uh, the blues musicians of Durham. Uh, at a time when I was working at the Haytown Heritage Center, there was discussions about 
And as the newspaper article states, five strangers got together to establish a historic marker on the American tobacco trail. Those five strangers consisted of one John Shilp, who's amongst us out here in the audience. Yeah. He can stand. Y'all need to give these five strangers a hand. It was initiated by a woman named Gail Welker, who uh, is no longer with us. Uh, Jim Walton and Glenn Henson. And? And, yeah, me. Yeah, <laughs> And actually, you can go online and see uh, the actual dedication of that mark on the trail. It sits right off. You're going down Fayetteville Street from downtown. Right after you, right, the, the trail crosses Fayetteville Street. And just to the east of Fayetteville Street is where that brick marker sits. Why? Because that is where, in close proximity, Blind Boy Fuller is buried. Now, I wrote a poem to celebrate it, and I think it's probably important I, I share that now, because it speaks to this whole notion of the interconnectedness of these, these artists. They sort of, yeah, they knew each other, they played each other, they inspired <laughs> each other, and so in that regard, I think it's important to note, because for me, it's about understanding how this music uh, builds upon itself because individuals um, teach, serve as mental guide, and the younger musicians are, in essence, apprenticed. So this poem takes its name from what is one of my most favorite of the Durham Blues uh, pieces. Uh, which is by Blind Boy Fuller. It's entitled The Point, Step It Up and Gone On, but it takes its name from Step It Up and Go. Um, certainly my other important blues piece is the one that Richard Trice recorded, which is Blood Red River Blues. But I, I'm going to need you guys to say this in order for me to move through this poem. So when I prompt you, I want you to say, Hey Ty, hey Ty, hand it down, hand it down. Hey Ty, hey Ty, hand it down. Give it a test run. Hey Ty, hey Ty, hand it down, hand it down. Hey Ty, hey Ty, hand it down. Hey, Y'all good, we can go on too. <laughs> hey Ty, hey Ty, hand it down, hand it down. Hey Ty, hey Ty, hand it down. Reverend Gary Davis told this man to tell Brownie McGee to hook up with Sonny Terry, cause there's some dancing to be done, some backer to be sold, some stories to be told by a string stringing, get picking, blind bad Durham dude, Wadesboro boy. Hey, hey, hi, hey, hi. Like black leads of Southern struggling, looking for love in all the wrong places, recording buku history, telltale and Spider Man on the strings, looking like my granddaddy up from the Carolinas, my grandfather being from South Carolina, up from the Carolinas, Fulton, him, Mac Daddy, slick, dapper, Dan, genius, clear seeing, third eye, preaching, party, party. Man child playing national steel in a cotton rag land. Here we go. Hey, Ty, hey, Ty, hand it down, hand it down. Hey, Ty, hey, Ty, hand it down. One last time. Hey, Ty, hey, Ty, hand it down, hand it down. Hey, Ty, hey, Ty, hand it down. Give hey, yourselves a hand. So I'd be curious to know from everyone, uh, you know, that, that spirit of the music. Is there anyone still keeping it alive? You know, there, there was John D. Holman, of course. He's, he's still with us, but he doesn't play so much anymore. Who around today he's is playing in the Eno on Thursday? He's playing in the Eno on Thursday, okay. I had been told by I've been told by Tim that he wasn't playing out anymore, but I'm delighted to hear that. He's on the, on the schedule. That's fantastic. Play with 
for the Wiggins earlier this year. Well, all right, all right. More fake news, sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to be proven wrong there. But uh, who else might be kind of keeping it going out there? Anybody got any thoughts? Well, if we're talking about here in Durham, that may be a difficulty. I just had a talk with my son, because he's done picked up the guitar, you know, quite, quite, quite proficient percussionist in Afro-Cuban with African djembe and trap set, jazz drum. But he's taken up the guitar, and I was saying, yeah, man, I'm going to do this program and all. He said, yeah, I'm looking at Robert Johnson. I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> you need to look at the Durham dudes. So you need to look at Reverend Gary Davis. The album's downstairs on the turntable right now. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. Give it a few years. But that, that, that's, that's, you know, what my hope is. I can't put too much pressure on it. Now, if we look beyond that, you know, one of my closest friends and associates has become uh, Eric Bibb, who actually is um, the godson of Paul Robeson. And he tours nationally. I had the opportunity to bring him here twice to Durham for the Bull Durham Blues Festival. But in his playlist, he is consistently uh, uh, playing and recording uh, Reverend Gary Davis. Um, 12 Gates to the City uh, certainly is one of those pieces. It's, it's always there. Me growing up, I first heard Samson and Delilah, and that's Reverend Gary Davis's recording in my own household. But I also heard the version in my own household because my father had both albums and valued them both was Peter, Paul, and Mary's uh, version of that song. But Taj Mahal certainly was influenced and still records and interacts with music makers. And I think it's probably important that music makers be referenced here in regards to the support that they bring and how some of these artists still come to us. But I think for me is Eric Bibb is one of those majors who's doing it. So I would say for all of you, do yourselves a favor and, and, and check that out. John Cephas and Phil Wiggins were a tandem that come out of that tradition of Sonny, Terry, and Browning McGee. John Cephas, guitarist, vocalist, songwriter, is no longer with us, but Phil Wiggins, uh, mouth harpist, harmonica player, is still touring and performing and pairing up with other younger musicians. The Piedmont style is what I, I think we're clearly talking about here. That, that tradition has, has rich players and younger individuals who are still keeping it alive. It would be nice to see someone right out of Durham do that, and there might be somebody we just haven't heard of yet. In somebody's household, at somebody's fish fry. So keep your ears wide open. So I'm gonna weigh in with a different kind of answer, okay? When I think about what the blues did in Durham in the 1930s, the blues emerged as a music of affirmation. It was affirmation of blackness. It was affirmation in the midst of stark segregation. It was affirmation in the midst of crippling Jim Crow. That in the worlds of those factories where there was work, there was also systemic structural racism that was endemic. This was what the Bull City was known for in part. Anyone who lived here at the time, if you talk about the blues, you talk about places of escape, you talk about places of affirmation, you talk about creating alternatives where the identity is not an identity that is framed by outsiders, but is framed within the community for the community. And if I think of that as a function of this music, then I think the blues, like all other musics, has its day. But when the experience of the community changes, the music has to change to speak to that transformation. And so as the experience of Black Durham changed, the blues in Black Durham began to disappear because it was being replaced by other musics that were every bit as vital, that were every bit as powerful, that were every bit as affirmative, and that in every way spoke to the new conditions of African American life in the whole city. So if you were to say now, who are the heirs? to 
the blues that were played in the Bull City in the 1920s and 30s and early 40s, I would say you don't have to look far. Just look at what's going on in Durham's hip hop scene, where you have that same vitality, the same themes, the same affirmation, and the same youth. You know, when we're talking about these Durham blues musicians, we're talking about people who were in their teens and early 20s for the most part at that point in time. We're not talking about elders. We're talking about kids who are creating music and making life out of it. And if I say now, who are those kids? The incredibly vibrant hip hop and spoken word, I would say, scene in Durham, in Black Durham. To me, those are the heirs. It's changed, but the function, purpose, and power are very much there. Just to add to that, um, you know, for me, I, you know, in teaching and talking about the blues, I work with my own definition, and that definition is uh, strained instrument, percussive storytelling, because I'm tying into the long oral tradition of people of African descent, and so blues is a part of that. Yes, R and B is a part of that. Preachers are a part of that. So that long tradition of orality is what we're speaking to, which does play back directly to what um, Glenn is speaking to. So yes, hip hop, more specifically rap culture, out of the larger uh, representations of what hip hop culture is, is a part of that long oral tradition. And I would have to say I'm in full agreement with that. Um, Bill, I've seen some pictures that I believe you were around when they were taken of Sonny and Brownie down here in the early 70s, hanging around the Liberty Warehouse. Would you, you would, would through those? Yeah, I'd be curious to know, you know, what, what kind of things did they tell you about way back when? Well, um, if I could take a minute and the court stretches this far. Here's one fact I'm not entirely sure about, but I, I think this is correct and I read it somewhere that when uh, Brownie and McGee and Sandy Carey went to New York. Um, they said they were never coming back south again. And, you know, they, they certainly probably had some good reasons and some experiences in the south that we don't even know about. There, a lot has been written about them. But somewhere around 1973 or 74, somebody persuaded them to come back and get a concert here. And um, this is uh, one of their concerts at a place no longer existing called the Frog in the Night Down. It was in Cameron Village. And um, the two Trice brothers, <coughs> Willie Trice is sitting in a chair, he's in a wheelchair at this point, and uh, Richard's brother on the left, and then uh, Brown and McGee and Sanitary. This was taken during the intermission of the concert there. Um, another event that happened here, and, and uh, I'll say this again, I tried to get this verified back then, but he wasn't uh, clear about it, whether he was responsible, but I didn't say he was responsible. Um, <laughs> Terry had written a song uh, called She Changed the Lock on the Door. <laughs> And this was um, about uh, a girlfriend he had in Durham. And um, her name was Florence. And my memory at the time, and I'm fuzzy about this sequence and everything from 40 years ago, but my memory is that uh, Glenn found Florence. And whether he found her or not, I don't know, but she ended up at this concert. Yeah. And um, there was quite a reunion between Florence and Sanitary. Uh, Sanitary at this point is happily married in New York and um, leans over and says, please don't let anybody take a picture of me and Florence together. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there, there was more than one reunion, and we'll, we'll go through that. This is the, um, the Friday Night Night concert. Bill Boyarski, uh, who has photographed the history of Durham since the mid-60s, uh, 
took all these photographs. Uh, and he gets very little credit for that. I just want to mention that. He would have been here except he's out of town. Um, sanitary and next to him is Cora Allen, Bon Boy Fuller's wife. And uh, we got them together. Sanitary had lived in the home with Bon Boy Fuller and Cora Allen. Cora Allen. Um, when he first came to Durham, he was in and out of their home. So there was quite a reunion with those two as well. Uh, the fellow on the left is Kent Cooper, who was sort of the guide, companion, and I think probably the manager for Sanitary in New York at that time. He also produced a record of Sanitary, which is one of the ones on the here. We walked around town and took photographs, and they reminisced over their time in uh, building together. This area, um, we built more hotel in the area next to um, uh, on Paisley Street. It's about the location where the DPAC is now. Uh, and then Sonny wanted to go down to the warehouses where he had plays. And these are some of the same warehouses that were still standing at that time where he had played during the tobacco market. So we got to this area near the warehouses, and he pulled out his harmonica and started playing. Oh. And you might be able to see there are two guys sitting in chairs there. Well, they were astonished <laughs> at what they were hearing. And um, Sonny felt right at home. He had no problem pulling out his harmonica, and uh, all of a sudden we were back 40 years before that. Um, Anyway, it was a great little tour around Durham. And then, I'm not sure which was first, the Chapel Hill concert or the Frog and Mayhem concert, but they played in Memorial Hall at Chapel Hill. I was there. Hmm? I was there. <laughs> <laughs> that was quite a night. It was. They, they kind of, they didn't get along well. They <laughs> took it to the stage that time. They kind of hmm. were ugly to each other, except they said there's a lady in the audience if I heard a stand up, it was Cora Fuller, Bob Fuller's widow, they sang, My little woman's so sweet. That's like one nice moment at night. Um, that's another unclarified situation. <laughs> you mentioned that they were not getting along. Um, my memory from Ken Cooper, the fellow who brought from um, Sanitary back to Durham in, in uh, 1974 was that Sanitary and Brandon McGee had not gotten along for a while. And I'm not sure if Brandon McGee had moved to Oakland, California by this time or not. But they, um, they would not travel together. They came separately. And uh, then you may recall we went to the motel where Sonny was, uh, where, where Brandon McGee was staying. And he had come completely independently of um, Sonny Terry and uh, sat down and had a nice conversation with him. Somewhere about another uh, part of this, they may have not been, they've been together so long and known each other so well. Uh, the, the, you know, yeah, friendships can kind of wear out after a while. But they were, but they were, uh, the Glenn, yeah, that's, yeah, we had But that was my brother that brought them to the Frog Night, Jonathan, and we had that, that was in their contract at that time, Sunday Air Traffic. That was the first time they'd been back to North Carolina since forever. Right. Right. And they did not speak, they came in from opposite sides of the state. <laughs> <laughs> We had um, we had to take Les Sam and, um, and Henry Johnson on that. I don't know if you guys were there at that, that Friday night concert, but that was because uh, 
because um, Peter Ingram owned the product, which was a jazz drum. He was not particularly a, a blues fan, but my brother and I were, and he let us let my brother bring him in because he got to work there. Um, so we had Lightning Hopkins and other people that the electric blues. But at that time, it was hard to get an audience for uh, acoustic blues. And I think Bruce Baskin, that some of you guys knew, um, Bruce Baskin being from England and being at the folklore department, I guess, yeah. at that time, did such a great job of recording a lot of people and put on that great concert at, at uh, Gerard Hall there in, in Chapel Hill that brought in Willie Trice and a lot of those people. But it, people like, we don't think of Peg Lake Sam and Henry Johnson as being, as being uh, Piedmont blues, but the styles were very different and a bit very similar. And they played a lot of the same songs, and that's not that far from where they were from to, to here. But there was not that much, you know, the electric blues stuff, Chicago clubs were hopping, and, and the electric blues stuff would draw. Um, you know, they'd get B.B. King and Muddy Waters would come to the big festival. But there just wasn't that much of an audience. Like Glenn was saying, it's like people had moved on. The young people were listening to other music, and the acoustic blues stuff at that time was not uh, not not so popular, but it was great that there were enough people that recorded and held on. Um, that, uh, that so another piece to this story, which sort of needs to be added in this visit, is there was also a concert that Brown and Sonny did at North Carolina Central. It was publicized on campus. There were eight people in the audience, oh. which I think. I think tells you all you need to know about about the the way this music has had moved on. It had been by that point deeply replaced by other musics which were more vibrant to that community. And so, and of that eight people, that includes Brownie and Sonny in that. <laughs> so you have a sense of of what that huge auditorium looked like. Yeah, I think it's important. I think it's important to note because of you know, I hear the alls. <laughs> Interesting. Um, you do need to take to heart what Glenn is saying. The music moves on. You have to think about how is this music valued in those times for younger people. You were not hearing it on the radio. You were not seeing it in your backyard. You were not seeing it written up in the newspapers. So it did not exist and have a connection. What was then and hot then? We're talking about 70s, 80s. 70s. Yeah. You're talking about R&B. Exactly. You're talking about funk. That's you're talking about me growing up. Now, my father would take us to blues concerts. So I value it and, and enriched by it to, to take it to heart as a historian. But I think it's important to know that that argument about why did the music die has everything to do with changing times, changing life experiences, changing valuation, changing cultural appreciation and engagement, and it is what happens. Uh, it's not a sad thing. It would be nice if blues could go on forever. But, you know, we jumped into a period of disco. <laughs> and, and funk died for a minute. So I think how I felt. But, <laughs> but I think in the long run, the reality is what it is. And we need to understand, take a lesson from the history and realities of culture as time moves on and what, what that means when we have shifts and changes that, yeah, result in that sort of an experience. It's not a sad and horrible thing. It's the reality. Right. of what happens right. with us, with humanity, as we move through life and politics and cultural uh, appreciation change. This is very informative. I'm learning a lot. Um, I mean, it's kind of great to hear, hear what y'all got to say, things I didn't remember. Um, I'll just finish with the Chapel Hill concert. There was one particular thing that happened, and, and since at least two of you mentioned that you also sensed that these Brandon and Ian Sonny Terry did not get along that well. They did not sing together. They sang, one would sing one step, one would sing another. Well, halfway through this Chapel Hill concert, 
they started singing together. And um, Ken Cooper, the fellow that brought uh, Sam Terry from New York, said he had never heard him sing together before. So, so something happened in that concert. It was bringing Cora on back uh, or something, uh, or they were welcome that they got here. I just wanted to say that uh, this is sort of the opposite of what you were saying about the small attendance. I saw Sonny Terry and Brandon McGee in the spring of 1977 the, in Boston at the Berkeley College of Music Performance Hall, and it was sold out. And that's a big, big thing. Glad to hear. Oh, yeah. Um, my, my question, I want to ask. I don't know if... Uh, uh, David McConey or um, uh, Girl So, is my name right? Yes. Um, if you can answer this question, but we know that Durham had a very, a history of like a black bourgeois middle class, like the, what we call Harris Street Gang, people like um, C.C. Spalding and um, J.C. Shepard, like the founders of um, Institute Mutual or North Carolina Central University. And it, like when I read the histories of uh, the Black Wall Street, Harris Street Gang, that's a very black bourgeois set, and like I don't see a lot of a, a, a lot of connection between those black that black community and the black community that Sonny Terry, Brian McGee, and Gary Davis represent. And so, how did I guess my question is like why is the why is the history of Durham blues documented in other black histories of Durham that didn't focus on capitalism, banking, education? Um, I think I'm answering my own question, but I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. There's a question in there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> I, would say, I would say this. If yes, you, you answered your own question within the context of the histories that are published. What is their focus? Are those cultural histories? No. Those histories are economic. Those histories are definitely celebrating and investigating the entrepreneurial uh, 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 successes of the black community. Yeah. And so there is a distinction that has to be made there relative to what, is there a very rich uh, cultural history of Durham that has truly been done in a way that, that values this aspect of that history plus all the rest? No, so that might be an opportunity for yourself. I'm not gonna take on the pressures. <laughs> but what I will say is, that that cultural history has yet to be written in full context. There's a um, a wonderful book that I that I just recently got, um, which looks at DC's jazz history. Uh, and so when you talk about well, there is uh, Durham's Hay Tie. Uh, Andre Van has done the photographic uh, renderings of history as uh, given to us graphically. Those give us an idea, and it might have some visual representation, but a sort of written history that analyzes the significance of uh, this culture is, is not fully available to us. Yeah, Baskin gives us some of it, and there are a few other places, and yeah, if you search online, you find it, but a very complete cultural history of Durham has yet to be written, and it sounds like that's what, you're, that's what you really want to see. The, the, the distinctions between class and where were they on this, you have to remember, those folks that started those businesses, that was in the early 1900s. Right. These guys are doing this in the 20s, 30s, 40s. So there is a, a time distinction there as well. But you can make class distinctions, if you will, in some regards, but I leave that investigation up to someone else. I got you. So I'm gonna add a little bit to that. To just point out that there was a thriving jazz community in Durham at the same time. Yes. That the uh, the hippest group in Durham was called the Bull City Nighthawks, mm -hmm. and Bull City Nighthawks practiced in the Bull City Barbershop, second floor, which was right next to the Biltmore Hotel, mm -hmm. which is also where when Cab Calloway, when Duke Ellington, when when they came to town, they all stayed in the Biltmore, mm -hmm. and the Nighthawks were playing for the barracks, for the Spaldings. They were with the Knights of the Royal Order. They were with the Masonic Lodges. So when one looks at that, the sort of class division, 
there was a whole different world of music that we know nothing about. And the crossover between the two was the piano players. Because the piano players who played with people like the Nighthawks were the same ones that played in the joints down in Haiti. And they were the same ones that played with Fuller and with Gary. So there are these legendary names, Murphy Evans, Hubert Sears, Jesse Pratt. We don't know much about it, but we know folks have said, well, they played with the jazz scene, but they also did stuff with the blues. So there's this curious and interesting link. But again, that's a history that we know very little about. That needs to be written. Definitely needs to be written. Yes, sir. Do you want to come to the microphone? Or? Oh, no, I'm fine. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so is there much of a connection from what you're talking about to what people now call down east blues or down home blues? Because I see a lot of concerts and shows that have artists that songs aren't played on the radio, but they're kind of, it's, it's kind of regional, but people go and they go to these dances, like a uh, cute shuffle, and they have songs with kind of risque titles, you know, stand up in it, blah, blah, blah. Is there much of a connection, even though it's not string based? Well, you have to look at, you're hearing that and experiencing that now. Yes, sir. Right. And so when you hear down east, you're thinking, we're, we're talking about Eastern North Carolina, mm -hmm. which does have, I mean, look, Debbie Long came from Kinston, a hotbed of black music productivity when we start to look at it, even to this very day. I can tell you the long history of saxophone playing black music educators, which leads us to Ira Wiggins in North Carolina Central, among other things. But with what you're speaking to, again, you're also uh, advancing the notion of community and regionality. And so who there is a significance to the folks there and what music did they bring and where were people experiencing it at these parties where there was the line dancing and all of that. That's a whole nother history to be examined and written about. I don't want to say that that is solidly connected in direct lineage to because of the say, oh, Black Boy Fuller influenced that. I don't want to say that, but what I will say is that the cultural, black cultural productivity is singular in how it provides for the community. Outlets for partying and socializing, outlets for getting together, outlets for training new musicians and others to sustain outlets for socializing and getting together and creating art. Okay? Thank you. Yes? Yeah, I can have a big one. Is there a way to distinguish in the 30s and 40s blues of Durham versus the blues of Chicago, the blues of New Orleans? Is there, is there a distinction between those two? I would expect it because of distance, but any thoughts on that? The short answer would be yes. yes. <laughs> Piedmont blues, and we'll hear a little bit of it in a few minutes here from Mr. Lightman, but I've always found it fascinating the, the ragtime and bluegrass influences to it. Uh, uh, Roy Bookbinder on stage at Merle Fest a few years ago said something that was I thought was very telling, which was back in the 1930s, whether you called something country or blues often came down to the color of the guy at the microphone. So uh, yeah, I, I mean that, that sort of country influence is brought to bear in blues around here in ways it really wasn't in Chicago, other than Chicago blues being rooted in the Mississippi variant of uh, acoustic blues from some years earlier. Y'all have anything to add? Yeah, of course. Good. Yeah. <laughs> you can start. Sorry, right, great. So, old strength musical performance, you know, in our nation has, has certain threads and route roots that it goes through. But when we start to look at, and I'll give you a prime example which you can experience online, I would say uh, Pull Up Blues House Party, which was a gathering of Piedmont Blues players, uh, actually in, in Virginia, John Jackson's homestead. John D. Holman and Chris Holloway, they seem to have crashed the party. They got word, oh, there's this gathering of Piedmont Blues players, and they go up, 
They sit around the table talking about this music. And in talking about it, they talk about playing for gatherings of black and white folks to party. So some of these players would be invited to play Virginia Reels, if you will. So the interchangeability of the styles, it being a strain music for socializing and partying. Yeah, we all like to do that, right? Who doesn't like to party in this room? Yeah, yeah. don't raise your hand. Yeah. Better not. But the bottom line is, the music has its purposes, and the styles of playing were interchangeable. You know, we can go into talking about uh, Leslie Riddle and his influences or, and, and connections to string band music, string, string instruments playing up in the western part of the state, up into Virginia. But all of those sort of distinctions that we could make there are also influences that we can clearly identify that, that trade back and forth. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to take my horse down, oh, tell me ride. Yeah. 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 So, so if I were to add and sort of say, what distinguishes the music of this region? I wouldn't say Durham, but I would say the region. Um, the African-American secular dance music of that time around here tended to have a ragtime flavor. It was two-fingered. It was always played with only a thumb and forefinger, that's all. If you had a third finger, you were lazy. <laughs> and if you, and if, you, if you used a slide, slide was okay for a few songs, but slide in this area was, was lazy man's music and lazy woman's music. It's, it's like you could use that for some, but really, it was about fast finger picking that invited fast couple dancing or fast solo buck dancing. Um, wasn't a lot of, there were slow pieces, but what really distinguished the region was the fast ragtime pieces. And those were the, those were the show pieces for all of these guitarists from the era. We'll do one more and then we're gonna have light to play. Yes, sir. Do you need the mic? No. Um, I'm quick there was a musician there named Thomas Burke. Oh, Thomas Burke. Wait, what do you need to ask? What are you asking about Mr. Burke? Is there anything about is, is there any chords? I mean, you know, you know, so, so Thomas Burke was one of the was one of the absolute masters. He was from Creedmoor, lived in Creedmoor. Um, he would come into Durham. He played. He was born right at the turn of the century played with a lot of the musicians in Durham, was better than a lot of them. Um, he was, all, rep, all words say that he and his sister, back in the 30s, was just really, really remarkable. He was the one who first told me the story of Scrap Harris. Uh, um, Thomas Burke, there are a few recordings, there are very few recordings that have been issued there are many recordings of Thomas Burke um, that have not been issued. They will be. Uh, but if you want to hear a, a rather remarkable one, there was an album that, an LP album that the state of North Carolina issued called Eight Hand Sets and Holy Steps, which was a survey of <coughs> sacred and secular music. And on the, on the sacred side, there is just a beautiful piece that Mr. Burke plays. And that's, I know the album as LP is actually still available um, through the North Carolina Folklife Institute on vinyl. It's never been converted to CD yet. That, that will happen. So there's not a lot out there written about Mr. Burke. Um, there are some recordings, though. Well, very good. Well, uh, Mr. Lightman, I believe it's showtime. Well, thank you all for turning up. Uh, this makes me real happy. We did a. Uh, state marker for Elizabeth Cotton over in the harbor a few years ago and I was surprised at how few people showed up for that maybe 15 or something. So this, this is real pleasing here. Thank you all for coming. I've been playing now about 50 years. Hard for me to believe. I started when I was young. I didn't have anybody show me. I learned from recordings and stuff. And I got into finger picking things when I was still in high school. So I attended the University of Chapel Hill in the early 70s. And uh, I 
thought I knew a bit about the blues, and I was allowed to take the uh, graduate folklore classes with Daniel Patterson as an undergraduate. There's this older uh, British fella in my class. He was 30 years old. He's Bruce Baston, and he knew everything about blues. So I thought I knew something. And it intimidated me a little bit. <laughs> So he was bringing all these really cool Piedmont Blues people to Chapel Hill when I was a young undergraduate. It kind of changed my young life. I thought, wow, this is it. These people live here. This, this stuff that everybody's going to do all over the world. And it ends up, it wasn't really like that. It was just a, a short window of time that I happened to be lucky enough to be at. Most of the time, died within years after I saw him. Willie tries big leg Sam, guitar shorty. Years later, I got to to work with the live blues people. My first guy I worked with Big Boy Henry. Met him in 1983 from over in Beaufort, North Carolina. I worked with him many years. I worked with Al Jermaine Hinton, Glenn Henson on Start Out Lane, over in Johnston County. We were friends. And Made friends her whole life. She's passed away last year with uh, George Higgs from over near me in Tarboro. I'm a more historical type player. I'm going to do a Conboy Boy Fuller song. Uh, he did some raunchy pieces. I got to do these. And so his titles, What's That Smells Like Fish? I Want Some of Your Pie. This one's about a you heard what a, about a honey hole. That's a, a, a nice fishing place. Or, <laughs> that's not what that's just about.
Marie. She got good love but she's stingy with me. She got a step and let go. Yeah, go. They can't stand that boots so where you got a step and let go.
We never, never got to see Fuller, but I learned uh, from Richard Trice, he saw him play, he told me. Thank y'all.